Welcome to the Chicken Chat, the official Chuck E. Chicken podcast, where we check in and chat with some of our favorite friends in the animation, voiceover, and family entertainment industry. I'm your host and voice of Chuck E. Chicken, Michael Cook. Today's episode is admittedly a bit of a selfish one for me. However, due to recent events, the timing could not have been better. Like many Chicago kids in the late 80s and 90s, I grew up watching WGN's Bozo every morning at 7 a.m. before school, as well as every Sunday until the show's cancellation in 2001. Now, while he wasn't the first Bozo Chicago had, that honor belongs to Bob Bell, my guest today was the last Bozo on television. However, long before he put on the big red nose and floppy shoes, Joey Dioria had been seen on television for a little over a decade. From his antics on The Dating Game, to the fiery performances of Dr. Flamo on The Gong Show, up to today, where he's still working as a prolific voice actor for hit shows including Yokai Watch, The Tom and Jerry Show, and The Mr. Men Show. We talk about all that and more on this episode of The Chicken Chat. Now, please give a warm welcome to my pal, Joey Dioria. So, yeah, I'm super excited to, I'm sure you get this all the time, but I grew up watching you. So thank you for my childhood. I'm a kid from Chicago and uh, you were on my TV Monday through Friday and every Sunday. So, (laughs) (laughs) Um, but uh, I want to talk with you a little bit more about just, uh, you know, Bozo, uh, Mm -hmm. because you've had an illustrious career. Um, <laughs> no, it's funny because I was doing a, a little bit of research and I found out that you were on the dating game at one yes. point. Very long. I was, I was uh, 17. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I had to ask, did you, did you win any of the, of the shows? Did you go on any of the dates? Was that a real thing? Did uh, that I, 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 I was on vacation in LA. Mm-hmm. Uh, I saw that they were holding auditions for the dating game. Mm-hmm. I did an audition. I made them laugh. And they said, we can have you on in three months. And I said, oh, I'm sorry. I'm just here on vacation. I'm leaving next week. Right. And they went, we'll put you on tomorrow. So, I mean, they they bumped me right in. That's so cool. Yeah. Uh, I did not win the date. Uh, I, I, I actually saw the video. Yes. It was posted, I think, on YouTube. And I saw it. And I went, well, I was adorable. <laughs> You still are. What are you talking about? You yeah. you, you wear that but, mustache well. Uh, number one, would you please say hello to Autumn? I'd like to have you fall for me, Autumn. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. Now, how about number two? So, mm. but I mean, uh, I was funny, and I think the girl didn't want to take a chance. Anyone that funny is uh, probably looks like a troglodyte. So she she went with the safe the safe guy. Was he safe though? I mean, uh, who knows? We'll <laughs> never know. True. Very true. So, but that's so cool. Like you, I mean, I, I will say I, I've seen a couple of interviews with you already with uh, Scott Spears. Um, oh, yeah. The two bits. That, and those are over a decade old. <laughs> um, so I know, right? Time flies when you're having fun. So if you don't mind me repeating some of the questions that he asked, because I don't know if any of my viewers have seen his show, um, but I have a few questions that I want to ask as well. Um, about stuff that he didn't get a chance to talk about with you. Um, but I want to first start off, how did you get in the business? Like, because um, this podcast is called the Chicken Chat Podcast, and it talks about animation and the family entertainment industry. So, By the way, I've, I've been watching some of the, the Chucky Chickens on uh, YouTube. Yes. That's cute stuff. Now, is that all cell animation or are you using flash animation? Uh, it's uh, it's hand drawn, but then it's scanned to the computer and colored using a program called Toon Boom. So, right. I saw I saw like your New Year's Eve thing there. Yeah. Uh, which was yeah. which which pretty much uh, showed up a lot of that. So it's, uh, that's pretty cool stuff. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a labor of love. You know, I, yeah. I'm a big fan of the 30s and the 90s. And well, I was going to say, it's a, <laughs> you know, if you did it in tones of black, white and gray, it would mm-hmm. look like an old Mary melody. <laughs> you know, we did one. I did one a long, long time ago in 2008 called The Wake Up Call. And that was the very first Chucky cartoon because he was inspired by an animator named Ub Iwerks. Oh, was, my goodness. Yes. yes. Later went on to Disney. Yes. Yes. And he was the guy who uh, cr- co-created Mickey Mouse with Disney. Mm-hmm. But before Mickey, they created a character named Oswald the Lucky Oswald Rabbit. Oswald Rabbit. 
yes. which Walter Lenz ended, ended up with. Yes. And yeah. Took to, uh, Universal. Yeah, exactly. And just that, like, obviously, you know, the story of what happened in 2006 with Disney right. and, and like that historic trade with Al Michaels going to Universal and Oswald coming back to Disney. And that's how I, I mean, I've known him my whole life. I mean, I had a Disney book that talked about Oswald and I was just like, I got to make these cartoons again. Like this, these are so cool. And I finally got to see a bunch of the like, Oh, one a night and trolley troubles and great guns. And I was like, this is so cool. And that's how it started. And then it, it evolved into what it is today. And we're, mm -hmm. we're currently working on a pilot episode, which I will be happy to share with you if you would like to see. I would love to see it. Cool. And uh, yeah, I, I thank you. That, that, that makes my heart feel good that, you, that you're enjoying well, enough it. Well, about you. Let's talk about you. <laughs> yes, uh, that's my line. <laughs> um, no, I, 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 I was, I was uh, when I was very little, mm -hmm. there was a show on TV called You Asked For It. Okay. And people would, it was sponsored by Skippy Peanut Butter. Nice. And, um, and uh, people would write in and say, how are chocolate bars made? And they would go to a chocolate bar company and show that. And then someone asked, is there a club for mu magicians? And they did an interview with Milt Larson, okay. the creator of the Magic Castle in Hollywood. Right. And that was the first time I ever saw Milt Larson or heard of the Magic Castle. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, just, I just thought it was exciting. And I just thought everything about Hollywood was, was, was thrilling. And when I was a kid, at the end of each television show, mm -hmm. there would be this thing that would go, made in Hollywood, USA. You know, you'd see that at the end of all these shows. And I went, oh, yeah. that's where I want to go. And uh, I, I, I wanted to be in show business ever since I was a kid. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts in New mm -hmm. York. I toured with dinner theater. Uh, <laughs> I closed more dinner theaters than I can remember. <laughs> Who hasn't in their career, yeah. right? <laughs> oh, I tell you. I mean, literally, uh, I, I was hired by another dinner theater and got there just in time as the sheriff was padlocking the door. I mean, oh, no. Yeah. So I was stranded in Denver, Colorado for a year while I gathered up enough money working as a waiter mm -hmm. to uh, get out to the West Coast. Oh, my and gosh. And the first people I looked up was Milt Larson of the Magic Castle. Right. And I ended up going to work not for the Magic Castle, but for his new vaudeville club called the Variety Arts Center, mm -hmm. which was in downtown Los Angeles. And uh, I worked there. And in between that, I would do things trying to get myself known, uh, try to get an agent and all of that other business. Mm -hmm. But I was taking an improv comedy class one day and someone came in and said, Chuck Barris is so desperate for acts for the gong show, they're paying after a minimum. Mm -hmm. And... I had already belonged to Equity, so Equity was my parent union. That's the Stage Actors Union. Sure. I, I joined. Uh, I joined AFTRA, and auditioned, and I would come up with one stupid act a week, to uh, in order to uh, you know pay my rent. Right. Back, <laughs> back then, AFTRA minimum was I think uh, like one hundred and seventy five dollars mm -hmm. for for, the, for a show, and that was my rent. Oh. You, yeah. you, poor you. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> I lived in Beverly Hills. No kidding. A hundred and seventy-five bucks for yeah, an apartment. I had an apartment the size of what is that? Your bedroom? Yes, this is my. My bedroom, whole yes. apartment was the size of your bedroom for a hundred and seventy-five <laughs> bucks. Yes. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> it's Holy cow. So, yeah. speaking of the Gong Show, your your mm. your your most famous act, of course, is Doctor Flamo. Flamo. How did you come up with that? Like what, like, how, I mean, what was the genius of the scales with the flame? You have to I, I, I watched the gong show, you know, several times just to get some ideas. Mm -hmm. And I remembered there were acts like uh, Swiss bell ringers. The guy would have a whole line of bells mm -hmm. and he would take one and ring it and, you know, and, and ring each one and make a song. Sure. And, and I went, well, that requires talent. <laughs> I can't do that. Um, so what I did instead mm -hmm. was I, I had a bunch of candles. It was the 60s and 70s. We all had candles. Ooh. Yeah. And, um, 
And so I, I lined them up from small to, to tall mm -hmm. and basically held my hand over each flame and screamed in a different key, depending on the size candle. Right. I did that for Barris. He thought it was hysterical. He put me on the show and I won. <laughs> Close enough. <laughs> I'd now like to do one of your favorites and I hope one of mine. Smoke gets in your eyes. <laughs> As far as I was concerned, this was just another dumb act. They'd boo me. I'd go home and collect 175 bucks. Sure. Anyway, uh, so I'm I'm on the show and I'm sitting next to a young lady mm -hmm. who I would say at the very least was rather unfortunate looking. She was not an attractive girl. And but she was dressed very well and she'd done her makeup, but she was a, a very homely girl. Putting, it's and, like putting, uh, putting makeup on a pig kind of deal. Well, I wasn't going to go that far. But <laughs> um, anyway, she turned to me and she said, I know I'm not attractive. And I went, oh, no, no, no. And she said, oh, please, no. I know I'm not attractive. Barbara Streisand is not attractive, but she is a great singer. And I am going to be a great singer. And I said, well, good for you. And she was on just ahead of me. Mm -hmm. And the big song of the day was You Light Up My Life. It was a big hit for Debbie Boone, the daughter sure, of sure. Pat Boone. Yeah. And she got out there and sang that song horribly. Oh, no. <laughs> I mean, this girl couldn't carry a tune in a barrel. Oh, no. It was awful. And the audience was screaming, kill her. I mean, the, uh, the audiences were, 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 were vicious. Sure. You never heard how bad the audiences were on your TV, but they were, <laughs> they were awful. Oh no. And I'm listening to that and I'm going, yeah, they're going to hate me. <laughs> and I figured, but I'm not taking this seriously. And this poor girl was, well, she thought this was her, her bully drink the fame and for it. Yeah. And I mean, I just, I just watched her in tears leave. And I went, Oh, that poor kid. Oh no. So I went out there and I went, I need just a moment, please, to make sure the candles are in tune. And the minute I started putting my hands over the flames and screaming, I heard someone in the audience yell, he's hurting himself. <laughs> and they cheered for the entire thing. And I won, which surprised me. And um, uh, at one point, you know, at the end of it, during the applause, I looked at the, at the panelists and I went, mm -hmm. you like that? And Barris elbows me in the ribs and goes, shut up, kid. You're a hit. Right. <laughs> there you go. So, yeah, but I won. And the prize back then was a thousand dollars. Wow. That was big money back in 1977. Sure. Unless you wanted the trophy, then you'd get $850 <laughs> because they charged you 150 bucks for the trophy. Now at wow. first, I was going to say, well, screw that. <laughs> but then I went, well, wait a minute. I'm still going to be getting my $175 from AFTRA. What the heck? I'll buy the trophy. There you go. And so I have an honest to goodness gong show trophy in my office. Well, you see, you made the right choice, Joey. You know, I, I think mean, so. Yeah. I mean, but, but Chuck Barris loved the act so much. He had me back several times. Yes. He and also it, did a thing called the Ra Ra Show, mm -hmm. uh, in which he had his favorite gong acts and celebrities. And I opened for George Carlin. No kidding. And George Carlin, because I was on just ahead of George Carlin. Mm -hmm. And 
George Carlin, uh, I passed him in the hallway and he went, well, you got bigger laughs than me. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but that was it. Years later, I ran in to George Carlin. Mm -hmm. He came to the Variety Arts Center where I was working as a waiter and he recognized me. Sure. I gave him and his guests a tour of the, of the, of the club. Mm -hmm. He tipped me a hundred bucks. Again, that was a big money. money. For yeah. And uh, a few years later, uh, Milt Larson said, Jim McCulley of The Tonight Show, he was Johnny Carson's casting director, is coming tonight to look at a couple of magicians. Mm -hmm. One guy does a very messy act. We'd like you to do Dr. Flamo in front of the curtain while we clean up the stage for the next magician. I said, sure. I did it. And McCulley was sitting right in the front row and he had two guests with him, mm -hmm. Tim Conway and Harvey Corman. Oh, wow. <laughs> now, McCulley had a reputation among comedians that he never laughed. No matter how funny your act was, he would basically sit there and analyze what makes your act funny. Mm -hmm. And Tim Conway and Harvey Corman literally laughed so hard they fell under the table. It was, it was <laughs> terrible. But I did the thing and Milt said, Jim McCulley wants to put you on the New Year's Eve show. And so that was uh, that was the 1983 New Year's Eve or 1984 uh, New Year's Eve show uh, of The Tonight Show. Mm -hmm. And uh, the rest, as I say, is television history. <laughs> now, is, is that the one that uh, Mr. Carson did not see your audition? Yes, that's so the one. I saw that clip and he was rolling like he, yeah. he threw yeah, that. I'm, oh, my gosh, that's so cool. Yeah. So you, you're doing the Tonight Show, you're doing the Gong Show, you're doing the Ra Ra Show. All of a sudden, you know, 1984. <laughs> Uh, it's there's major news on WGN. Uh, the world famous Bob Bell, who is Bozo, is retiring. The programs recorded by Bob Bell will play back through Friday, September 7th. The Bozo Show will continue the following Monday, but there will be a new man behind the makeup. Well, we're not going to replace Bob. We'll find somebody else to play Bozo, but it won't be Bob. Tell us what happens next. Well, Right after The Tonight Show, I got a call from a personal manager. Mm -hmm. This was a woman who had been working as a casting director <clears throat> and had hired me a couple of times mm -hmm. uh, for, for the show Alice. Mm -hmm. And she mentioned her name. And of course, I remembered her. Right. And she said, um, I would like to manage you. And she did. And she spent an entire year turning work down <laughs> because... <laughs> Because they the because the 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 scripts would would offer me what they called an under five, which mm -hmm. meant under five lines. It wasn't a guest starring role. It wasn't important. It was a character part. Mm -hmm. And I went, but that's great. She says, no. If you do under fives, then they'll think you only do under fives. I'm only want I only want to cast you in. I only want you to be cast in starring or guest starring roles. And I went, okay. Mm -hmm. But basically what she did was she poisoned my name with every casting director in town. Oh, no. And then dumped me because she says, well, you can't get work in this town. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah. Oh, that was my reaction. And um, so she said, look, I'll tell you what. They're holding auditions for Bozo the Clown over at KTLA. I can get you in there tomorrow. Uh, you, you, if you get it, you don't have to pay me a commission. I went, oh, thanks for nothing. Right. Now, Bless you. In the back of my in the back of my mind, I'm going, I know a dozen guys that are ex ringling clowns. Mm -hmm. I know guys that are jugglers, mimes, Venice Beach Street entertainers. Mm -hmm. And I'm thinking that's the kind of stuff I don't do. I'm right. an actor. I am not a clown. I am not a juggler. Uh, I have no clowning skills. Mm -hmm. So I basically told her I wasn't interested in and. Um, we parted company. Anyway, one day I, I was on my way to an audition for, for a theater audition, and I found myself driving down Sunset Boulevard mm -hmm. past KTLA, and I saw a line that stretched for four blocks. I kid you not, four blocks of guys in clown makeup. <laughs> and it was a hot summer day. Oh, and no. I mean, just being in a clown makeup and grease paint Oh, I just a lot of sad clowns oh. that day. Yeah. 
They, well, if they started happy, by the time the, the 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 makeup melted, they were they were very sad. Right. The paint the painted highways of L.A. <laughs> Pretty much. So I ignored it. Uh, mm -hmm. I went to an audition, went home, and about a few days later, my wife read an article that was reprinted from the New York Times, mm -hmm. in which the producer of the show, Al Hall, said, "The only people we've had audition are clowns, mimes, jugglers, Venice Beach street entertainers." people who don't talk, they do right. silent acts. Mm -hmm. And he says, we need somebody who knows old vaudeville and burlesque comedy who isn't 90 years old. <laughs> and I was, I was merely, I think I was about 30, 32, 33 back then. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, uh, I don't know. And my wife said, they did everything but put your name in the article. So I sent them the Tonight Show uh, DVD. And uh, about four or five weeks went by and I never heard anything. Mm -hmm. And I figured, well, they probably hired somebody, but I want that DVD back. That's the only copy I have. And I said, I'm going to be calling Chicago. I says, it's got to be earlier in Chicago than it is here. Just then the phone rang right. and it was Al Hall mm -hmm. and said, we'd like you to uh, come in an audition. I said, oh, uh, okay. He said, great. We're sending you by FedEx a plane ticket and a script. And I said, okay. He says, can you leave on Friday? And this was Wednesday. <laughs> and I went, okay. <laughs> so my wife drove me to the airport. I flew mm -hmm. to Chicago and uh, got to, to WGN. Mm -hmm. And uh, there was Roy and Fraser Thomas. And, you know, they were sitting there going over the scripts. Mm -hmm. And Roy Brown looked up at me and went, uh, I broke my leg in three places. And I said, don't go in those places. <laughs> and he looked at Al Hall and said, so far, so good. There you go. <laughs> and so uh, he put me in one of Bob Bell's old costumes. Mm -hmm. He was about a good four inches taller than me. <laughs> he was a massive guy. I, I he understand. Was a big guy. He, was, he was over six foot. Right. Um, I'm, I'm five seven. Okay. Anyway, but they had a makeup artist there, a guy by the name of Mike Fink. Okay. Who was a gravelly voiced guy and he smoked the whole time he's putting the makeup on. He says, yeah, I've done a lot of clowns. I've done a lot of clowns. You know, I was going to audition for the show myself. <laughs> and, and, and I'm all the while I'm worrying that he's going to be dropping ashes on my face. Right. Yeah. So he puts me in makeup and I figured, well, I guess they want to take a few pictures, see what I look like in the clown makeup. Mm -hmm. Just as they put the wig on me, Roy Brown comes in in clown makeup and he says, hey, we're in luck. This is going to be the biggest audience we've had yet for an audition. And I went, what? <laughs> yeah, he says, we've been uh, all of the finalists. We, we shoot a full show in front of a live studio audience. Okay. And he left. And at first I was kind of annoyed. I went, well, they didn't tell me about this, you know, for crying out loud. Um I should be prepared. I'm, I'm, I'm offended. <laughs> and I, I thought, what the heck? I'm in clown makeup. If I mess <laughs> up, they'll never see me again. Right. <laughs> so I just chewed up the scenery. I had a great time and Roy made it fun. Right. Uh, the most important thing that I learned was that they were desperate to find somebody who could be Abbott to Roy's Costello, mm -hmm. to be hardy to his laurel. Right. I mean, and that was basically it. Most of these acts were solo acts and they didn't know the team dynamic. Right. And you guys definitely had that. Well, we did. And, and, and that was fun. And somebody's been eating my porridge and they ate it all up. Oh, I'm Mikey gonna... must be here. He'll eat anything. Well, I'm exasperated for trotting around in the woods all day. Boy, oh boy. I'm going to sit on a... Whoa. <laughs> I sit down on my tail and I <laughs> Anyway, at the end of the show, we're shaking hands with everybody as they're as they're as they're filing out of the studio. Mm -hmm. And one kid who had been maybe eleven or twelve looks at me, gives me a friendly punch in the shoulder, and says, "You done good. I hope you get the job." <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. And there you go. And there you, you go. did done good. Well, so I, <clears throat> I thought so, but the thing is. Mm -hmm. took the makeup off, had a, just enough time to catch the flight back home. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and as I'm leaving, Al says, we have to make a decision in the next two or three days. Well, let you know. 
And about four weeks went by. Oh. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> so I figured, well, that's it. I didn't get it. Mm -hmm. And again, it was early in the morning. I'm fixing breakfast for my son to take him to school. Mm -hmm. And just then the phone rings and it's Al Hall and mm -hmm. says, uh, listen, we're sending you a plane ticket. <clears throat> uh, and it was Wednesday again. He says, <laughs> uh, we'd like you here by Friday. And I went, okay. I said, like, is this uh, a callback? You want to see mm -hmm. me again? And there was silence. I went, no, we're offering you the job. <laughs> And I went, oh, hang on. Mm -hmm. And I put the phone down and I said to my wife, you want to move to Chicago? <laughs> and she said, why? She says, they just offered me Bozo the Clown. And she went, yes. So we did. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and that was it. I, I flew in, mm -hmm. uh, met with their uh, program director and uh, mm -hmm. everybody. And I, I got the job. <laughs> that is fantastic. Now, what's super cool about because I've seen, believe it or not, I don't know if you've seen this or not, but there is a clip of you early, early Bozo. I want to say 85 or 86. Mm -hmm. And they're doing a game. You, the first part of it is that you introduce uh, uh, Cobra, like the G.I. Joes. Oh, yeah. And was that an old Bob Bell costume that you had to wear? Or did they fit that to you? Because it looked like it was kind of falling apart on you a little bit. <laughs> Well, you know, what happened was that some, I, th I think I only had one costume and, and, mm -hmm. and so it would get kind of ratty at the end of the week. So right. probably, but no, they, they, they had made me custom costumes just before the, the wig showed up within minutes of the show starting on my first day. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> that was, I mean, that thing was FedEx and they, and I'm sitting in the dressing room in the full costume and makeup, but no wig on, mm -hmm. you know? And just then they brought in the box. And I mean, within minutes of the show starting. So that's that was, so, that was, that's so cool. Yeah. And, and they, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, this no. is all about I was just going to say the, the first few weeks went, went really well. We got mm -hmm. great reactions. And I got a call one day before starting rehearsal to mm -hmm. see the uh, program manager of WGN to go up to his office. Sure. And I, I'm going down, I'm sitting across from him and he's smiling, this big smile. And he goes, how's it going? And I went, great, terrific. He says, we've been getting some mail. And he pulls out a stack of six letters and he throws them in front of me and says, pick one, anyone. So I picked it up, he says, read it. I went, dear WGN, we hate the new bozo. Oh no. <laughs> Get rid of him, bring back Bob Bell. And he goes, the other five are just as bad. <laughs> And I went, uh-huh. <laughs> and he sure. said, this is terrific. And I said, why? <laughs> and he said, because we figured that, you know, people were so crazy about Bob Bell. We figured we'd probably get a couple of hundred hate letters. Right. We expected if we got 200 hate letters, we figured you're a success. He says, if we got over 500 hate letters, we'd go, ooh, this isn't good. And if we got a thousand, we were going to cancel the show and fire you. <laughs> <laughs> and I went, uh-huh. And he says, but all we got were six. You are a bigger success than we could have hoped. That is fantastic. Congratulations. <laughs> I went, thanks. He says, you want to keep these? And I went, no. <laughs> <laughs> I see there was the one mistake. You got the, the gong show trophy. You didn't I should have kept my hate. <laughs> So he was like, this is like the one person mm. said that I suck. One out of six. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. Mm. Oh, so well, I went back and I told them the story. You know, mm. I told Roy and Frazier and Al and they all collapsed. They thought oh, it was a riot. Of course. Yeah. I, I actually wanted to talk about, because th those two guys, you, you talk about Roy and I love Roy. As a matter of fact, I wanted to show you this. I got mm. this on eBay. Do you know about this? Do you remember this? Does this look familiar? Oh my gosh, at all? the Cookie the Clown makeup kit. Yes, the, I, I've never I, seen the commercial for it. I've never seen the commercial for it, but I saw I saw this on eBay. I was like, I have to have this. I only got the book. It didn't come yeah. with the makeup, but it came with a whole makeup kit. Marsha Brodine, who was Wizzo, mm -hmm. and who who created lots of magic kits. There you go. <laughs> the magic uh, Marshall created a Cookie the Clown makeup kit. 
Oh, so this and was it, Marshall who did this. Yes, Marshall. Yeah. If you look somewhere on there, you'll probably see Marshall Brodine Enterprises or yep. Productions. Right, yeah. right on the there back, right there. There it is. That's so cool. And I, I love this. My son book. was in the commercial. He was, was he I think, really? nine. Yes. Oh, uh, I... Yeah. If you, I need to see that. I need to look that up and find it. You, uh, I've got to get a hold of Marsha's son. Mm -hmm. He inherited all of Marshall's items, and I've right. got to, I've got, you know, I got to get him to see if he can dig that out of the files and send that to me. Oh, that would be just the biggest kick. Hey, where'd the cage go? I says that's magic. And if someone says, "Hey, Gumpy wants to know where the cage went," I said, "I told him it's magic." Company pulls out a gun, puts it to the man, clicks it back, and says, where's that friggin' cage? And that cage came out of where it was <laughs> faster than it went where it went. True story. Frazier Thomas. Frazier Thomas. You, you had a little bit of time with him. He was there for the first year, yep. uh, passed away in 85. I mean, tell me, do you have any memories of Frazier? Oh, yeah. Well, Frazier, I, I got the biggest kick out of Frazier. Mm -hmm. um, he was the most pompous blowhard you know i mean he 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 was a sacred cow at wgn i mean mm -hmm. roy brown used to work for frazier right roy operated all the puppets on the garfield goose show mm -hmm. and frazier always treated roy like an employee oh you no know? i mean <laughs> and 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 i was i was told by the producer al hall at one point don't improv with frazier is it just do the script straight as it is? Don't do any because Frazier does not like improv, mm -hmm. which was like waving a red flag in front of a bull. <laughs> <laughs> we were we were we were doing a bit, and I sat there and I went, uh, "Mr. Thomas, 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 is that a Welsh name?" <laughs> and Frazier went back and went, "Well, yes, my ancestors came from Wales." And I went, well, I knew they didn't come from people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. And, uh, how many times did you break him up on the set? I have to ask. <laughs> well, he didn't break up. Frazier really? Would break up. No, he would, he would merely just go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. He does seem like a very stuffy kind of guy. Was he was very yeah. stuffy, but it it worked great for a lot of things because we needed that foil mm -hmm. to, to work off of. Right, and um, we were we were doing a bit in front of the band, the band back then. <laughs> it was a trumpet, an accordion, and a drummer. <laughs> right, and I'm standing there with Fraser, and the accordion player is playing something softly in the background. I turned to look at him, and I turned to Fraser. I said, "Do you know the difference between an accordion and an onion?" And Frazier went, well, no, no, I don't. And I went, nobody cries when you chop up an accordion. <laughs> that, that did make him laugh. Comedy is a very serious form of drama. And uh, when you try to get ready to do a piece of comedy, a comedy bit, sometimes the preparation for it is a very serious thing. It has to be done just exactly right and uh, what looks so thrown together and so easy to do sometimes takes a lot of preparation oh that's oh i love these stories these are so yeah. cool and what was super cool of uh, you were in a transitional period because mm -hmm. you came in right at the tail end of kind of the the original bozo circus bozo show era and then around the the late 80s is when they got professor andy and you know the whole everything changed like what was that like how well, big it, it, what, what happened was, i mean when bob bell started the show they were bringing in real circus acts mm -hmm. they had a 14 piece band right you know? um eventually that got whittled down over the years by the time bob bell's last season it was again the three musicians right uh i had the i had the three musicians for i think a year or two Mm -hmm. And then they said, <clears throat> we can't afford to hire three musicians. We're only going to hire one. And I went, um, we need a drummer. He says, fine, we'll get a drummer, but we need piano. Then we'll get a piano player. What do you want? And I had done a few county fairs with Marshall and Roy. Mm -hmm. And there was a fellow by the name of Jerry Peters, mm -hmm. who was a wonderful musician. And he would play on the show and he had a, an electronic piano. 
but that's all it was, was an electronic piano. But he was good and he knew how to follow us and he would play music that was almost like having a drummer doing, doing rim shots and stuff. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when Al said, I don't know, I, I said, well, Roy and Marshall want Jerry Peters. And frankly, I like Jerry too. Why don't you bring him in? I love that parallel movement where you move up. Right. So Al brought him in and listened to him. And about a day later, Al says, I want you to hear something. <laughs> and he played Andy Matran's audition. Mm -hmm. And I'm going, he plays a piano and drums? He says, no, it's all on a keyboard. And I went, well, that's incredible. This guy, I'm sorry, I like Jerry, but yeah, this guy. He went, no, listen to the whole thing. I said, mm -hmm. I don't need to hear the whole thing. This guy's great. Listen to the whole thing. All right. So I sat there <laughs> for half an hour while he did it. And I mean, Andy could make it sound like a, a calliope, mm -hmm. a trombone, mm -hmm. drums. I mean, he literally had one set of keys with drum, uh, uh, like for like when we would walk, you know. Dun, 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 yeah, dun, yeah, 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 yeah. Or if we did a joke, ba -dum, tsh, yeah, all of that. All of uh, footfalls and rim shots. And I'm like, oh, that's so cool. Yeah. And and I just thought, oh, man, are we lucky to have him? And Andy was a tremendous, a tremendous uh, improvement to the show. We all know that the professor rocks. And we know that the professor raps. He can play the old masters. He even does the new kids. And then from him, everything just like the logo changed. The he got animation put into it with the with the intro. Um, you know, you had you know it was basically you, Roy, and Andy were the three headliners. And then Wizzo, you know, come Wizzo on. would come in a light once a week, right? Um, <clears throat> but but what happened then was that we were taking up one of the most valuable pieces of television real estate, oh. in, you know, at WGN the seven to nine slot. Yeah. They then cut us down from a two hour show to an hour show. And then they figured they were going to put in a morning news show, but they had to put in a morning news show because let's face it, a television station's job is to make money. Right. And if you have a morning news show, you can get car ads, uh, beer ads, big, you know, big department stores. I mean, all of your big national products We'll go on that. A kid's show, you get breakfast cereals and toys, right. and those cool. those things don't bring in a lot of money. Mm -hmm. So that's why they moved us to Saturday, to Sunday morning. See, that, that doesn't make any sense mm -hmm. to me, though, because, I mean, that's because you were like, the 90s was a huge decade for kids' entertainment and for family entertainment. I mean, Disney was doing their big renaissance. Mm -hmm. I mean, they had so much, like Burger King and McDonald's was blowing up. And all of a sudden now one of the biggest shows that Chicago had is stripped from the weekend, from the weekday lineup to Sunday. It didn't make any sense. No, oh, it, it made sense financially. It made sense financially. And by also what was happening in the 90s mm -hmm. was that cable sta uh, stations were developing. Right. Nickelodeon, Disney Channel, Cartoon Network. Right. These were things that were taking the audiences from us, yeah. you know? And, yeah. and and that's and that was it. And by comparison to the sort of things that you could get on Disney Channel or Nickelodeon, mm -hmm. uh, we were we were pretty old hat. Uh, that's I you know I I get that. I mean, but as a fan of the show and as a fan of like stuff, like I just and as a creator too, you know, mm -hmm. like that to me is like one of the, the the difficult things to wrap my brain around. It's like you got a show that's really successful, and if you're if, if it's okay, hang on one second. It's tell me I got like less than a minute and I feel like an idiot here. So bear with me. Let me do this super quickly. We're going to be pull... right back after these commercial messages. This episode of the chicken chat is brought to you by our amazing supporters on Patreon. 
Our patrons get early access to every video we release, as well as exclusive behind-the-scenes content on the making of the animated series, access to voting polls, as well as exclusive artwork and perks made only for them. For as little as three bucks a month, you too can join the ranks of Chucketeers. Thank you all so much to all of our patrons for your support, and we hope that newcomers will check us out at patreon.com slash Cartoons for more information. Thanks, folks. And now, back to the show. Now, back to the Bozo Show. And there. we're back. <laughs> now, back to the Bozo Show. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, my goodness. Okay. So, we were talking about Professor Andy coming in and him just blowing everybody away with yeah. his, with those audition. He coming on to the show. Um, we're, how big of a, uh, cause there was a lot that changed, like mm-hmm. the, the buckets for the grand prize game changed. Um, we were also talking about like how Cartoon Network, Nickelodeon, we were talking about a lot of stuff. Yeah. So, um, I have a bucket story. Please, please <laughs> tell me the bucket story. Well, the buckets that they were using when I started with the show mm-hmm. were the original buckets from the Bob Bell years. Right. And they decided to go high tech. They got a big board. They put lights around it and so mm-hmm. on. You know, the, the problem was the buckets that were used on the original buckets were bought at a toy store. They were sand box buckets, kids, the kind of buckets kids would take to the beach. Now, nowadays, the buckets the kids play with are made out of plastic. Right. But in the late 50s, early 60s, they were tin. Right. And so they bought six tin buckets, Mm -hmm. spray painted them, put the numbers on them, and then attached them to the board. Mm -hmm. Uh, The game was invented by Don Sandberg, who was the original producer of the show and who played Sandy the Tramp Clown. Right. Anyway, when they decided to do this and GN said, yes, new buckets, that'll be great. They couldn't find tin buckets anymore. (laughs) And so Al Hall, the producer, went to a tinsmith in Evanston and literally brought him one of the buckets Mm -hmm. and had him duplicate the buckets. So buckets that were probably bought in a toy store for 59 cents a piece Mm -hmm. ended up costing about $15 a piece. Oh, no. (laughs) Holy cow. So those yeah. buckets were tin buckets. The yeah. Electrical. That's, that's really interesting. Cause they, they yeah. look like plastic buckets. Like that's super, yeah. that's, that's super because cool. That's what you're used to seeing. Right. And then we took, and then they put the last bucket on the back mm-hmm. and they were going to bring them to the museum of broadcast history. Right. No, actually that wasn't it. We were doing some special event and we were going to play the bucket game, the grand prize game at the event. Mm -hmm. And driving back, we hit a bump and one of the buckets fell off. No. Yeah. And like off the truck. Yeah. Off the truck. Well, everyone was in a panic. Oh no. Bucket number six is gone. (laughs) What are we going to do? Um, Actually they had us in a limo Mm -hmm. and they stuck the buckets in the, in the, um, in the, in the, what do you call the back of a car? The, the, trunk? the trunk. Right. But but it didn't fit all the way in the trunk. So the last one and the part of the board was sticking out the back uh-huh. and they kind of tied, tied the trunk down. So <clears throat> Al said, someone's going to find that bucket. They're going to keep it. It'll be a souvenir. You know, we'll never get the bucket back. And I said, you know what we do? We go on the news. We go on the news. We say Bozo lost one of his buckets. I said, I can do a thing on the news. We'll mm-hmm. offer a hundred dollar reward and six tickets to the show. Wow. You know? Right. And Al went, and Al went, that's that's a good idea. That could work. And he and just then he had sent some of the uh, interns to follow our route to see if maybe they saw it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and this kid Joe comes in and he says, I found it. <laughs> <laughs> you did? And he picked it up, it got run over by a truck, it was flat as a pancake. <laughs> And of course you showed it on the show what happened, right? Or no? No, no, of course not. Oh. Al immediately, 
Allie immediately contacted the tinsmith, mm -hmm. made another bucket, repainted it to match the other five, right. you know, and that's the, those are the buckets that are at the broadcast museum today. Oh, that is fantastic. So when you go there, cause I've, I've been to the museum a number of mm -hmm. times, it's su such a great place. So when you go and you see number six, that ain't the original, that is a duplicate. Right. Yeah. That is so cool. Yeah. Like, okay. An, a, you you did a show at Disney World. Yes. How tell me about that experience? What was that like? Like being well, in the Yeah, go ahead. That was hysterical because you know, Disney has a rule. Only Disney characters are allowed in the park. Right. There we were the first and only non-Disney characters to be doing a show in the park. How are you? I'm fine. It's nice. It's nice to see. It's nice to see. Yeah, okay. Okay. It's nice to see. <laughs> oh. Well, we're going, to, we're going to pick a boy and girl player to help us play the grand prize game. But first, um, we're going to pick our at-home players. Okay, now let's see. We got, yeah, these are the girls. All right, so, uh, hello, Princess Jasmine. Would you just, just pick one? Just pick one, any one at all. Okay, there we go. And uh, let's see who that is. Her name is uh, Kylie Weimer, and she's from Indianapolis, Indiana. And it was incredible. Uh, we had a great time. I mean, Disney footed the bill for everything. Wow. Airfare, hotels, meals. I brought my wife and son, mm -hmm. you know, they enjoyed the parks while I did the shows. And, um, oh dear, we had, we had so many, so many great things. <clears throat> I would have to get from one side of the park to the other. Mm -hmm. Now they couldn't take me because we, we'd have gotten mobbed. Right. So, so, uh, you know, and if people wanted to take a picture, we couldn't stop. So we would ride, I would ride in a golf cart underneath the park through the tunnels. Right, the utility yes. doors, yeah. That's so and, cool. And there was this, this uh, young lady, she was my, uh, she was my liaison. Mm -hmm. And her boss was a pain in the neck and my boss <laughs> was a pain in the neck. And, and she said, would you like a margarita? I said, I'd love a margarita. And so we stopped under a Mexican restaurant. They brought us two margaritas. We joined them. Every now and then, Al would get, <laughs> Hi, Al, we're, we're, let get up. And then she'd hang up. So yeah, that, we had a great time. Oh, that is so cool. Now, uh, there was a show called, oh dear, I can't remember. It was a Star Search. I think it was okay. called Star Search. It was hosted by Ed McMahon. Mm-hmm. I believe so. Scott Callen? I don't know. I think it was called Star Search. It was yeah. back in the, in the 80s, mm -hmm. uh, early 90s. And um, Ed McMahon was the host. Mm -hmm. And we went on the set. And who should come by but Ed McMahon? Who laughed and said, well, we have something in common. He had played a clown on a show called Super Circus back in the 50s. No kidding. Yeah. Wow. There's a, probably a very famous picture of a clown with a big red nose, and it says the end printed on the nose. That's that's Ed? That's Ed McMahon. No kidding. And we chatted, and then I said, by the way, I said, this isn't the first time we've met. And he goes, oh? And I told them that I was Dr. Flamo. Mm -hmm. And he said, Johnny talked about that act for weeks. <laughs> <laughs> well, how cool is that? That's yeah. how, Why didn't you get another invite? What happened? <laughs> well, that was the only act. I'm not a stand-up. I'm an actor. <laughs> I tried like a devil to come up with something else with Dr. Flamo, but mm -hmm. uh, it, it never, it never really came about. Different songs, you know? You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The thing is, it's a one trick pony, you know, I that's, know. that's pretty much it. Well, but, I, and, but and by then I was on my way to Chicago. <laughs> well, they, see, there you go. Better, you know, one door closes, you got a window to fly through. Exactly. Uh, Defenestration, so much fun. Um, <laughs> but um, no, that's so cool. I <clears throat> Now, obviously, the, Roy, oh, oh, the other person I, I had to ask about, we talked about Frazier a little bit. I mean, you know, family classics, Garfield Goose. Um, Al Hall, mm -hmm. I've seen a couple of interviews mm -hmm. with him. He seems like a very distinguished guy in front very. of the camera. Mm -hmm. But behind the camera, he sounded like a little bit of a jerk. <laughs> Not a jerk. Al was an A-type personality, I guess you could say. He, <clears throat> he, 
he he had a he had a, a way of making things go and heaven help you if you get in the way. <laughs> it was it was just, Al did not take well to having to redo anything over again. Sure. One of the first things Al told me was we do the Chicago School of Television. And I went, "Okay, what's that?" And he says, "No scripts. It's off the t- it's off the cuff and what goes into that camera spills out into people's living rooms. We don't go back. <laughs> Which I soon learned was a lie. <laughs> what? <laughs> yes, because I was doing a, an introduction one day and the voice comes over the, over the speakers, uh, Bozo. I went, yeah, uh, we need to reshoot this uh, opening again. I said, what did I, you were fine. You were fine. We just need you to move to your right. So I moved to my right. More. <laughs> More. Move more. Perfect. Do it. <clears throat> so I did the intro. Mm-hmm. Uh, as I'm getting out of makeup that night and about to leave, Al says, come here, I want to show you something. <laughs> and so I'm, I'm doing it. And he says, this is your first take. And I'm doing it. And I'm right. doing it. And as I'm doing it, the audience is behind me. And there's a bunch of Girl Scouts and brownies. And there's a mom holding a little baby. Oh. And the baby starts fussing oh. and fussing. So the mother pulls up her shirt, one breast drops out, the baby starts feeding. <laughs> and this little, this little girl in the brownie uniform is watching me and she turns and she sees the mom breastfeeding. She turns it. <laughs> <clears throat> this is, wow. Yeah. That's Chicago now, television for you. Been, <laughs> yeah, had this been live TV, mm-hmm. that would have spilt out into people's living rooms. Right. And that then Bozo would have been off the air at that point for, or maybe we would have had a lot more viewers. I don't or, know. You know, either way, you know, change well, the show. Bozo exactly. after dark, you know. <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll Bo, remind me about Bozo after dark. I'll tell you something about that. Okay. We um, so they 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 had to cut that out, and they said, right. "I hate I hate editing stuff." Damn it, we can't keep that in. <laughs> That's, I mean, I, uh, I, you know, I, I like that the stories that Al told when Bob Bell passed away, for example, and they had the whole, you know, tribute to him um, and the KO pectate with the elephants. I don't know. Oh, you, yeah. So did you do stuff like that with him, with, with any of the other guys or was well, that every now Bell and then, guy? every now and then we would do that. Roy Brown could be a bit of a, a wise guy. <laughs> he would, you know, he would, he would, he would make me look extra bad. By every time Bozo was bullying him or picking him, he'd go, oh, poor cookie. And the audience would go, oh, oh. which would make me look like a jerk. So we're doing a bit one day mm-hmm. in which cookie steals the treats. That was the bit. I'm baking cupcakes. I put the tray of cupcakes down. Cookie's under the table. He grabs the cupcakes, goes under. We hear eating noises. I go, well, what happened to the cupcakes? So I then take a cake out. I put that down and he reaches, he takes the cup and we hear eating noises. I turn around, it's gone. The third time is I put, a, I put uh, some brownies on the table and I see him and I watch it and I go, ah, uh, I then go around the front and I pull him out from underneath the table. I said, so you're the one that's been eating all the treats. He goes, yeah. He says, you ate all the cupcakes. Yeah, I ate all the cupcakes. You ate the pie or you ate the, the, the cake. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I ate the cake. You ate the brownies. Yeah, I ate the brownies. Now, the punchline is, and you ate the pie. And he went, well, I didn't get any pie. And I go, well, here, have some. And I hit him with a pie. Right. Well, I changed it. I went, oh. you ate you ate the cupcakes. Yes, you ate the, the cake. Yeah, you ate the brownies. Yeah. You ate all the goodies that I was making for the widow's and orphan's picnic. And I turned to the audience and I went, Oh, <laughs> that's awesome. And Roy was going, <laughs> and, I went, and I suppose you even ate the pie. He went, I didn't get any pie. <laughs> and I went, no, well, they won't miss this. And I <laughs> be sick. Some pie would do the trick. Cookie, this is no time to think of food. Food? Hey, you're right. I can't remember a time when I've got to cook some cake for my boss's daughter. (laughs) What? (laughs) 
A A <laughs> Okay You know that's true <laughs> If the robbers knew we saw them We would be stewed Food <laughs> I don't remember the last time you were booed <laughs> <laughs> Especially my boss's daughter. <laughs> Should I? <laughs> Oh my gosh, oh. Roy, you guys were, you really were a, a, ter a terrific, terrific team. Um, obviously, you know, Roy left the show in the, in the mid nineties, I think it was. Yeah. 93, yes. mid to late nineties. Yeah. Yeah. And then around him, Wizzo also left the show. And right. <clears throat> how did, I mean, obviously Roy was, the, the Wizzo magic was kind of going out of style a little bit at that time. No, Marshall, Marshall was, Marshall was having some health issues himself. He didn't want to uh, continue doing it. And he hated putting on the makeup. He hated the mustache and the beard. That mustache fell off a couple of times during the show. Oh, yeah. I believe. Yeah. Oh, easily, um, yeah. <laughs> um, you had a couple of, uh, of clowns. I believe Adrian Zamed was one that you had on the show. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, Spiffy came on. Right. Um, now, were you able to kind of be in the process when you brought on um, Rusty the Handyman? And oh yeah, yeah. What happened? What happened was Al wanted me there for the auditions, mm -hmm. much like how having Roy there when uh, when they were auditioning new bozos. Mm -hmm. um, and um, again, we had a lot of people who came into audition. They didn't do the massive search that they did for bozo. Right. It was all it was all done in Chicago, mm -hmm. but we got a lot of birthday party clowns, people who would talk like they were on Romper Room, mm -hmm. you know, and it was it's like and I, I remember I sat down with with one one young lady and I said, look, I said, do you know what burlesque comedy is? You know, <clears throat> these that, you know, and I did a few jokes for her and explained it how and she's nodding and she's saying yes. <clears throat> And this is, and it's all improvisation. It's right off the top of your head. Right. He says, I, she says, I work off the cuff when you, when you're doing kids' birthday parties, you got to be able, I said, good. And it was like everything I told her went in one ear and out the other. And it was completely, you know, she, she, she just dumbed it all down. Oh, and it was like, oh, darn. Right. There was one girl that Al really wanted us to get. She was a ringling clown mm -hmm. and in cl clown makeup, this girl looked beautiful out of clown makeup. She was gorgeous mm -hmm. and, and she was very pretty and very young and, and vivacious. No wonder Al wanted to get her. He, well, <laughs> the thing is, the thing is she wasn't an actress. She, she was, she was trained to be a circus clown. She was great with physical comedy, mm -hmm. but she couldn't talk. <laughs> you know? Oh no! Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, and that I mean, me being the you know the producer type, that could have been a fun throwback to uh, Sandy the. Tr I mean, you kind of were yeah. It would have been great, but Sandy the Tramp was a dumb act with four other clowns besides Bozo. Right. Uh, having having a. Uh, they did not want to hire three clowns. They only wanted to hire one other clown. Mm -hmm. And they were desperate to hire a girl. They wanted it to be more inclusive. They wanted, you know, sure. to, to, and which was great. We auditioned two girls in particular. Mm -hmm. One was very good. She was an actress, but she was an actress who basically needed a script. Uh -oh. And the other actress was an improv comedian. Mm -hmm. And they went with the actress. I liked the improv comedian better. And, and I said, this girl's great, but she, 
if something happens, she 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 fumfers. Right. But they hired her, and it turned out she was pregnant. <gasps> oh no! Yeah. So they quickly had to build her a costume that would expand with her, mm -hmm. and they hired the other actress to fill in, and so they alternated them. Mm -hmm. And then they realized, I can't be mean to a girl. I can't hit a girl with a pie. I can't spray a girl with seltzer. Oh. So they ended up hiring a guy, and that was Rusty. All right, hold on right now. She's What's in the going, middle. Who are you? Oh, we just got here. This is our first job after first clown you. you. Oh, please, 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 one at a time. Hey. Oh, my turn. You're my biggest fan. I'm your biggest fan. Oh, my name's Pepper. Oh, well, how do you do? <laughs> nice to meet you. Oh, nice to meet you. Ah! <laughs> anyway, the one girl eventually moved to California. Mm -hmm. And then the second girl, she and her husband moved to California. And uh, so it was just me and Rusty. Mm -hmm. And that's how, how that's how that worked out. That's super cool. And you, are you still in touch with, um, I forget who, I please don't kill me for not remembering. Well, Rusty was a Robin Urich. Yes, Robin, yes. Are yeah. you still in touch with Robin? Do you still Oh, yes, see yes. I, 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 I hear from him from time. He's, he's living in Sarasota. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's been having some health issues. So he's, he's not as active as he was. Sure. Uh, I ran into Kathy Schinkelberg, who played Pepper. Mm -hmm. uh, she's touring with a one woman show. I happened to catch her show. Nice. Michelle Gregory, who was Tunya, she and her husband are still living in, in California. And, mm -hmm. um, and I've, I, I used to see them pretty regularly when I, I lived in, 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 in Burbank. So, sure. Yeah. So, I mean, Bozo, of course, goes on for, you know, till 2001. Um, and it you had a big 40th anniversary show and mm -hmm. it was really cool. Now, correct me if I'm wrong. Roy was part of that last show. Like he came in dirt, like right before the big pie fight or was that another episode? I saw a WGN special not too long ago where they were celebrating. No, I, I believe Roy had passed away. That's what I thought. Yeah. 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 So he, I don't, had done, he had done, I think, a, a 35th anniversary guest appearance. Right. So yeah. that was the other, the 30th anniversary show. Because you got to hang out with Ned Locke. You got oh, to hang out with Ray Rayner. That was the 25th anniversary show. Mm -hmm. How was yeah, that? That was, the, that was the big special that they did. That was the big special that they did at the Medina uh, Temple, Temple, which I believe is now uh, a Bloomingdale's. <laughs> yes, which I was heartbroken about because I wanted to visit it when I went back to Chicago. I live in Davenport, Iowa now. Uh -huh. but, well, but, uh, a funny thing about that, it has this huge... Um, stained glass dome mm -hmm. and i had done a few uh medina shrine circuses there and i did a bit with a confetti cannon mm -hmm. that shot confetti straight up and into that dome right and people told me that years later when they would be shopping at bloomingdale's mm -hmm. occasionally still little bits of confetti will still float down that's so cool <laughs> i gotta go see it now yeah. <laughs> Well, I'm sure by now it's, they've gotten rid of it all. Oh, yeah. you never know. You never yeah. know. I'm going to catch one. I mean, like, see, Joey, yeah. I got one. I got one. Yeah. So Bozo, I mean, how hard was it for, for the Bozo show to be off the air? And then what was the transition for you hmm. after Bozo was done? And then you started doing uh, a lot. Did you do more screen work or did you go straight to voice acting or how did that well, go for you? Uh, basically what happened was when, when I knew the show was going to be canceled, I started looking around for other work in uh, Chicago. Mm -hmm. There's only one guy doing comedy live in Chicago, and that's Rich Coase, who plays Sven Gulli. Right. The hardest working man in Chicago television. <laughs> um, he's the only one who's got a gig like that. Uh, I, could not, I could not transfer over into news or anything like that, mm -hmm. having been Bozo. Right. And so there was, there was no work for me in Chicago. So I said to my wife, we're, we're going back to L.A. I have still a few connections. Mm -hmm. And uh, I ended up doing a play uh, that was written by Milt Larson and Dick Sherman of the Sherman Brothers. Nice. Uh, called, um, it was called uh, Pizzazz. And it was uh, roughly about the career of these comedians from the 1890s called Weber and Fields. Oh. And uh, they were the German Dutch knockabout uh, 
performers. They did the very kind of broad physical comedy that you would equate more now would say the Three Stooges. Okay. That was the kind of stuff that they did. They also are famous for this joke. <clears throat> Who was that lady I saw you meet last night? That was no lady. No lady. That was, was my, my wife. wife. <laughs> That's where that joke comes from. Really? Yeah. That's so cool. And, and we did that play. We did it in uh, Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, you know, they still have it. I, I think they're still tinkering with it, but I, I did it. And uh, I, I, I started doing some theater work again. I worked with several theater companies in, mm -hmm. in the Los Angeles company. And I ran into a number of my old friends from the voiceover days, Richard Epcar and uh, Rocky Solitoff, mm -hmm. uh, and of course, Mark Risley. And I, I, I did a lot of work with them, including like Yokai Watch. Yes. And, um, and Tom and Jerry through uh, Renegade uh, Animation. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, yeah. So, and, and I still do uh, voiceover work. I get auditions through my agent in LA and mm -hmm. I... Uh, Record them in here, which is a, a a little padded room the size of a of a shower. That's I, I have mine, but it's kind of currently uh, it's my walk-in closet. So, but it's uh -huh. a little. But a lot of people use use walk-in closets. Yeah. So, but I wanted to sit down and be comfy when talking with you. You know, so yeah. I don't have the big. I, I wasn't smart enough to put a chair in, in yours. <laughs> Well, mine isn't so much a chair. It's a padded stool. So, yeah. See, there you go. Um, the Mr. Smiley show. Yes. How oh, the was Mr. it? Men show. Yes. The Mr. Thank you. The Mr. Men show with Mr. Smiley. And you were, yes. you were Mr. Mean, correct? Or Mr. Rude? I was Mr. Rude. Mr. Rude. I was Mr. Persnickety. Mm -hmm. And I was Mr. Scatterbrain. And I was the narrator. Yes. That was a fun show. I've seen a couple of episodes. Though. Tell me about how did, how did that come about? That came about from my friend, Mark Risley. He mm -hmm. uh, called me in for it and I auditioned for it. The British were there. I, a, a lot of the British people from the, who, who you know, have the franchise. Mm -hmm. And they were said, we're looking for a voice for Mr. Rude. And I knew they were British. So I did a French accent <laughs> because I know the British and the French still have a thing against each other. Because they don't get along very well. Exactly. No, exactly. and they loved it. They loved it. And so I did Mr. Rude. What are you looking at? What are you looking at? You think that is special? <laughs> Wait until you see what happens at midnight. Mr. Rude! When they took the show back to England, they mm -hmm. kept the animation and they removed all of the American voices and replaced it with British voices, except for Mr. Scatterbrain, mm -hmm. which was me, in which I did an Ed Wynn impression, mm -hmm. and uh, Mr. Rude with the French accent. Oh. And, and when then when people, the, the head of, of production or uh, of children's television with the BBC was a French woman mm -hmm. and she was watching the show and she went, that man, he sounds like me. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, American actors. <laughs> when in doubt, blame the Americans, right? Exactly. <laughs> That's, um, you know, and so for people who are watching this, you know, we're, we're actors, we're, we're both in the animation industry. Uh, I've done voiceover work as well. Um, when you're doing, like, are there shows that you want to work on that you're like, talk to your agent and go, I want to be on this show. Can you talk to, you know, Tom Ruger or can you get on the phone with somebody and be like, <laughs> you know, there might've been a time maybe 50 to uh, 70 years ago that agents did that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But now basically I'm one of several hundred voiceover actors. If I get something from a Nickelodeon show or a mm -hmm. DreamWorks show, I just sent out two auditions for both of those mm -hmm. roles that I think I would have been, I'd be great in. Right. But, you know, it'll depend on when they're listening to it, whether or not they want it. Right. Um, I, I finished one for Nickelodeon uh, for called The Loud House. Yes. And uh, I'm the voice uh, of um, Buzz, who is a practical Joker ghost. Uh, and uh, it'll be on their uh, Halloween special. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. So, you know, that's kind of fun. Are there any shows that you would want to be on? Like, you know, anyone you... that will pay me. <laughs> good answer. Very yeah. good answer. Um, so 
one of the cool things recently, um, you know, as as you spoke, the original guy who owned, we're going to go back to Bozo very briefly, oh, yeah. but um, I want you to Larry tell me. Harmon. Larry yes. Harmon. Yes. Owned the character. Did you ever think that the Larry Harmon estate would ever not own Bozo? <clears throat> it's hard to say. I would say I, I pretty much figured that once Larry passed away, mm -hmm. you know, there would be no more real driving force behind it. Right. Um, <clears throat> the Bozo show that I did you know, back in the in the 80s and into the 90s, in the mid 1980s, the, the mid to late 1980s, mm -hmm. the show was doing so well. The general manager offered Larry Harmon an enormous amount of money to buy Bozo. They wanted WGN and Tribune wanted to buy Bozo, franchise it, and market it. And <clears throat> Harmon wouldn't sell. Wow. And from what I understand, they offered him not only a huge amount of money, but a, a continued large sum every year for the rest of his life. Mm -hmm. He refused. Wow. Um, and then, uh, so I figured that was pretty much it. And I figured, well, it'll the, the, the franchise or the, or the copyright on it will eventually run out mm -hmm. and Bozo will be forgotten. Right. I mean, uh, Bozo would have been forgotten in the 1950s if Larry Harmon hadn't bought it. Right. Uh, Capitol Records gave up their children's record division. Mm -hmm. So uh, when Larry Harmon came by and offered to buy the character from them, they, they, they took it. And Harmon did the one thing that Capitol Records could not do. They made Bozo successful on television. Right. Capitol Records tried several different television projects with Bozo and they didn't work out. Mm -hmm. But Harmon, Harmon took it locally to each local station. And, uh, and, and I think that that's where, where Bozo's success really, really came. He was already a nationally known figure through the records. Right. And uh, so, so doing it locally made it, uh, made it more personal. Did Larry have any sort of uh, influence on the show itself? I mean, obviously. No. Okay. <clears throat> no, not really. He was in L.A. Mm -hmm. uh, when, when, I, when I came into audition, they said, don't do Bob Bell. Don't imitate Bob Bell. Make him your own. Mm -hmm. We don't want, we don't want to try to do an imitation. Right. And I said, well, what about the Larry Harmon? He says, don't do that either. We prefer, we, we prefer originality. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> now, I understand that um, there was a guy who apparently did a very spot on impersonation of Bob Bell. <laughs> uh, yeah, that was a very, this was, this was a story that Al Hole told me. Um, one day, a guy comes through the door and the guard at the front desk thought it was Bob Bell coming back from some appearance. Right. Because the costume and the makeup, I mean, he even made a wig mm -hmm. that was that was perfect. Wow. And he's talking like Bob Bell. And the guy's ready to, to punch him in, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. when, when another guard says, Bob Bell is in California. And they went, <laughs> what? And they, and they threw the guy out. But he was, yeah. That's, I mean, did he get to like, did Al see the guy or like did Al, he get Al, in? Al, Al was coming down the hall because they, they called him and said, Bob Bell's here. Uh -huh. So Al thought, Al thought maybe he was visiting mm -hmm. and, and he, he's going, <laughs> you know, he says, cookie, cookie, right? <laughs> and, 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 yeah, that <laughs> wow. was kind of scary. Oh my gosh. That's, that's, that is a bit horrifying. I would. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, you know, <laughs> <laughs> well, they're out there. You they know, are. they are out there. Um, thank God nobody did that for you. I mean, but no, no, you... nobody. <laughs> Besides, the show wasn't continuing. If I had retired and they were continuing the shows, mm -hmm. I'd be very curious to see if somebody did that. <laughs> um, the same guy. Probably. <laughs> He's out there somewhere going, I got my Dioria. Let's go. Um, do you think um, with the advent of the internet and with every, like you mentioned in one of your interviews that you were writing a lot of the shows at that point. Yes. Um, and you said that you were ready to go with the, you thought that the, the upcoming season after the 40th would have been the best that you were going to do. We had 
everything in place. Mm -hmm. We had stage hands that really loved the show. Mm -hmm. We had a director who really paid attention to things. We were, we were, we were getting the comedy between me and Roy, me and Roy, me and, and Robin, uh, really working well. Mm -hmm. And and because I was writing the scripts, they were much better. <laughs> uh, but do yeah. You, do you still have, do you remember any of your ideas that you had for the- Oh, I have a filing cabinet full of them. Do you really? Oh yeah. Oh. Wow. So, cause <laughs> do you think, and, and just out of, you know, cause obviously Larry Harmon, he had his animated Bozo. Mm -hmm. um, and kind of the, one of the reasons why I wanted to speak with you, obviously, and bring it up Larry Harmon, is that after 75 years, the rights to Bozo have been transferred from the estate of Larry Harmon to actor David Arquette. Correct. Who is very much, now have you seen his Bozo? I have seen it. I have seen it. Um, I've seen it on, I've seen a number, I've looked up a number of the YouTube uh, uh, clips of him. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> a lot of people have been very, uh, annoyed with the fact that he hasn't done whiteface right but david arquette is a recognizable personality and movie star right and by just wearing the nose and the little red around the mouth and the wig david arquette has to be seen through bozo in order to to keep what is i don't think he's he's going full-blown clown and yet he's planning on changing the makeup. He's planning on changing. I mean, the costume has a lot more uh, silver and mylar on it. Yeah. Than I've yeah. seen. I don't know what he plans to do. He's he's introduced a, a, a young lady called Jozo. Yes, Jozo Bozo. Um, uh, he's, um, I think he's planning on, on using other clowns. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if he's planning to take them nationally or whether do it locally. I don't know what he's going to do. But right now he's getting all the publicity he can, and 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 that's that's important to keeping the name out there. Right. Um, I received a text from him just a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, he wants to do an interview with me. I think he's going to do a documentary on Bozo the Clown. Oh, cool! Now he, David, he, <clears throat> he did another uh, documentary called "You Can't Kill David Arquette." Are you familiar with that? I've heard of it. I haven't seen it, but I've, I've, I've heard watched of it. it. He basically decided to become a professional wrestler. Oh. Yeah. And basically got his butt handed to him, I think a couple of times, but he, but he's, he, you know, he says wrestling isn't fake. It's real. And uh, yeah, he, he, he's done, he's done a lot of that. So do you think he's um, going to do something like that with Bozo or? Yeah, he's probably going to do a documentary on Bozo. He's probably filming a lot. He's gone to a number of clown conventions. Mm -hmm. uh, he's been to a few clown conventions and I'm sure he's been videotaping that. Right. Uh, and uh, I mentioned that, you know, he should he should interview Robin Urich. Mm -hmm. Robin's father was Bozo the Clown in El Pas Paso, Texas. No kidding. Yeah. That's... There's a fellow... Uh, I know named David Eaton, who wrote a book called Being Bozo. Mm -hmm. He was Bozo the Clown in Ohio. Uh, I knew David uh, in Ohio when I was doing dinner theater. So we right. were friends. That's super cool. Yeah. Now, do you think if they ever reanimated Bozo, mm. would you want to go off for the voice? No, because I'm willing to bet if they did that, it would be David Arquette. After all, he is he is Bozo now. Yeah, yeah. Um, but to I some. Very <laughs> you know, are, if you're familiar with the the charity Red Nose Day, as a matter of fact, mm -hmm. I 100 percent am. <laughs> there you go. Uh, I was curious, and I was going to write to him and say, you know, that's a natural to get Bozo involved with that. But I recently saw that Bozo is going to be uh, a part of Red Nose Day, so oh, I'm wonderful. I'm, I'm happy to hear that. I mean, he's. He's going to be using the character to do good. Right. You know? And so that's, that's nice to know. That's super cool. So is it safe to say that your, your days of clowning around with the Bozo character are kind of in, in the past? I'm 70 years old. <laughs> Nothing looks worse than an old man in clown makeup. <laughs> Ed Wynn pulled it off. I'm just saying. 
Ed Wynn never wore clown makeup. That's true. Ed Wynn, the, the, and in fact, by comparison, what Ed Wynn did was very similar to what uh, David Arquette has been doing with Bozo. Only thing Ed Wynn did was the exaggerated eyebrows. Yes, that yeah. is true. So, I mean, it's just super cool that, um, you know, and, and what's really cool is that you're, you're still working. And the, the beautiful thing of voiceover is even now talking with you, we can still hear the bozo voice. It's there a little bit, but it's not as exaggerated as the old <laughs> as it was. My wife, my wife once said, there's a thin line between you and bozo and you're erasing that line. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, it's, you know, it's a great, who, who wouldn't you want to be compared to more than bozo, you know? Mm. So, I mean, that's, that's well, my take on it. So well, um, I, I had a lot of fun. And you gave a lot of fun for all of us. So, so what are you doing now? Like, what's the next step? Uh, are you still auditioning? So what's, what's I'm on the- still auditioning. I still get a few voiceover auditions. I've done a few parts. Mm -hmm. I finished recording a, a video game uh, voice. Um, I can't mention it because we have a non-disclosure agreement. The dreaded NDAs. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and so, um, but you know, there, there are things like that. Mm -hmm. uh, I have a friend who is currently working on a animated project and uh, they're going to bring me in to do some voices. Mm -hmm. so we'll, we'll find out. Okay. Very cool. Yeah. Uh, I mean, Joey, it's, this has just been a hoot and a holler to, to have you here. Um, for anybody who is trying to get into the voiceover business, um, you, you I, I think it's, um, uh, I think it's safe to say that you are, you're kind of the new Roy Brown where or he was, <laughs> He was an amazing second banana. And I think that's oh, kind yeah. of, you know, there's nothing better than being the, the second banana. Um, what advice would you give to somebody who is saying, I want to be a voice actor or I want to do, you know, what you've done for so many years? Well, acting, acting is, is acting. I mean, you, you need to be working. You need to be out there doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're young, you need to get the kind of education that you, you need. I went to the American Academy of Dramatic Arts. A lot mm -hmm. of friends of mine went to universities like, uh, Harvard and Yale and, mm -hmm. and got acting degrees and met, met people who went to UCLA and got to know people in the film, uh, business as, as, as a part of it. It's the old expression is it's not what you know, but who, you know, true is true. And um, most of the work that I have got over the years has been through friends who I have worked with in the past. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked, I did a lot of work uh, looping uh, foreign films into, uh, into English. Mm -hmm. uh, I worked with a bunch of people back in the late 70s, early 80s. We would dub uh, Spanish cartoons, Japanese films, and we would, we would, we would show up at this studio at nine o'clock at night and would mm -hmm. work until six in the morning. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> just, just dubbing these things. And back then, if there was an edit, they had to take the tape and cut it with a razor blade and then retape it. Oh no. Yeah. I mean, you didn't have the kind of electronic uh, things. Nowadays, if I did a voice and they go, gee, I love the take, but it was a little long, they can speed it up slightly and mm -hmm. make it fit. <laughs> That's super, that's, that's so cool. I mean, and that's yeah. stuff that, you know, a, a lot of us do. I'm very yeah. good friends with Mike Pollock, who is um, the voice of Dr. Eggman in Sonic the Hedgehog. And he's, oh, yeah. Yeah, he's done a lot of, he's actually Tommy Turkey in Chuck E. Chicken, which is really, ah. really cool. Yes. Okay. Um, so what's super cool about him, like he's, you know, he's told us a little bit about his, his days. Of, ugh, I'm speaking too fast. I apologize. <laughs> Slow down, cook, relax. Um, his days at four kids and dubbing, um, did you do work with four kids or was it other companies or what? Like, what? no, I, um, I, I worked with insomniac. I okay. was in, a, I was in a, a thing called, um, ratchet and clank, a crack in time. Mm -hmm. In fact, if you look up ratchet and clank, a crack in time, there is an opening credit. I am the voice of Alistair Asmuth, the, uh, the other Lombax who, who ratchet finally runs into right it's great it's great series the ratchet and yeah. series. So. oh it's terrific stuff so but he died at the end so there was <laughs> continuation. 
Darn it, no more paycheck. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> How? What's the difference between uh, recording for a video game compared to um, a TV series? Oh, it's it's very little. Um, I mean, I went into the studio mm -hmm. and there would be a director, and I would go through the lines, mm -hmm. and um, and and that would be it. You know, he would, and then what what I loved about the um, Ratchet and Clank series was that it then went to the animators. Mm -hmm. And I remember the director said, the animators are having so much fun with your voice. They love what's what's going on. Yeah. And 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 he actually brought in some of the earliest clips to show me, which which are really neat. Uh, on my uh, Facebook page, I think I do have a clip from Ratchet and Clank on there. I'll have so, to check it out here. Let, yeah. me, let me see if I can post it up. And if I, it's it, the one with the Bozo, it's the Bozo group. But, oh, the Bozo group. Yeah, the, yeah, the, the, the Bozo thing that I did. Okay. I did, a fan, I did a Bozo fans uh, Facebook along with my regular. Oh, okay. I'm, I'm looking on your actual uh, Facebook page. So yeah. I will have to look that up later then. But well, you might look up films. If you, go, if you go to mine and look up films or clips or something. Videos. Yeah. Here we go. Yeah, videos. Let's see. There you are. Yeah. I yeah. see you. So there it is. Oh, um, there's the trailer. Yes. Yeah. Um, but I'm, I did it. And I, uh, you know, again, I work with a lot of the same people. Mm -hmm. You know, the trick is to get other people to think you're as wonderful as your friends do. <laughs> well, you are quite a heck of a wonderful guy. And I'll be honest with you, I would, it would be a, a, a kick in the pants for me to have you on Chuck E. Chicken one day. I don't know if I could afford you, but I definitely would love to have you on the show. I think that would be just so much fun. Um, Joey, it has been, oh, before we go, you got to tell me the Bozo at, at Bozo After Dark. You were telling me. Oh, yes, Bozo After that. Dark. <laughs> um, when, when Robin Urich and I would, would rehearse the bits before I started writing them, the bits were so awful. We would, we would, um, we would improvise. And sometimes, sometimes we might work a little blue. <laughs> And I found out that WGN had closed circuit television. Mm -hmm. And one day the general manager came in and said, I was talking to the guys in the sales department and discovered they were all in one office watching the feed from your, from your rehearsals mm -hmm. and we're breaking up. Oh no. <laughs> and he said, if we could get away with doing Bozo After Dark, I think that would be the funniest show on television. I mean, we would we would get we would get very silly, of course. And and of course, that's when Al Hall would yell, "Would you two idiots stop screwing around?" <laughs> to which I would say, "You do realize you're talking to two grown men in clown suits." <laughs> it sounds like Al really took clowning around extraordinarily seriously. Oh, very seriously. When we were at Disneyland, if we were doing something and we we're being silly, he'd say, we didn't come here to have fun. <laughs> <laughs> Only Al sounds like yeah. that. Uh, it's very, it's kind of disheartening because I would have loved to, I think I got started with this a little late. I would have loved to have been able to talk with Marshall, um, Ray Rayner, all those guys. You know, I'm, I'm, I'll be 34 on Thursday. So, yeah. you know, for me, it's kind of sad that I think now they're all gone. Like the uh, entire yeah. the entire Bozo cast is gone. Pretty much. Um, but just to be able to have you, I got to talk to Robin and and everybody else if I could reach out to them and be like, hey, I spoke to Joey. Tell me about your experiences on the show. I believe Robin is on Facebook. You mm -hmm. should be able to find him. I, I He is. I, I tried to reach out to him. He has not responded back to me. So we'll see what happens. But. Um, but Joey, it has been a, a, a pleasure and a half. I mean, I wrote, I, uh, hopefully this has been a good birthday present for you. This <laughs> has been a great early birthday present for me. Um, any, any final thoughts before we get off the air? No, just, uh, just keep laughing. No. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, no, um, it's, it, it's been a lot of fun and, I wishing you all the luck in the world with uh, Chucky Chicken. Mm -hmm. I, uh, I've, I've enjoyed watching uh, a few of the, the clips before uh, before coming on to talk to you this morning. So, well, thank you. I, and thank yeah. you for all the support. Like we we yeah. need it. Let me tell you. 
as these folks who are watching know, <laughs> we know all the help we can get. Yeah. Joey, uh, it has been a pleasure and a half. I would love to have you come back on again and just kind of clown around and talk more because I'm sure there's more to talk about. But well, um, you and again, I apologize for the Chicago filming of this interview. <laughs> what can I say? You know, well, you have to work off the top of your head. 100% and nothing like clowning around. Yeah. Um, but thank you so much. Um, and I'm going to just I'm going to go ahead and stop the video real quick. But before I do, thank you folks for watching. Be sure to uh, uh, subscribe, uh, check them out on Facebook. Uh, or do you have a do you have anything you want to plug? Do you know? Not really. Not no? really. But I'll let you know. I'll let you know. <laughs> there you go. Well, thank you, folks. Thank you for watching. And uh, we'll uh, I'll you know here come the end credits. Thank you all so much for watching, as well as a thank you to my pal, Joey Dioria, for being my guest. If you want to learn more about Chicago Kids television history, I highly suggest picking up a copy of The Golden Age of Chicago Children's Television by Ted Akuta and Jack Mulquain. Also, be sure to check out the Museum of Broadcast Communications in the heart of downtown Chicago, located at 360 North State Street in Chicago, 60654. Links to the book as well as the museum website will be down below in the description. If you enjoyed the show, please be sure to give us a like, hit that subscribe button, and leave a comment down below. What was your favorite part of Chicago television growing up? And as mentioned earlier, please consider supporting our show on Patreon. We're working real hard to make new Chuck E. Chicken cartoons, but they do take a while to produce. So, we hope you'll enjoy this supplementary podcast to help bridge the gap between releases. Thanks all so much for chicken in with us, and we look forward to chatting with you all real soon.